I like that word, future. Um, I will be presenting our next participant, um, Christopher Buttle, who is a Dean of Students at McGill. And I will tell you a little bit about him. Whoops. Um, and then I'll tell a little story. So uh, Christopher Buttle is an award-winning teacher at McGill and nationally. His research is focused on the biodiversity and community ecology of insects and spiders with a specialty with, um, in the Arctic setting. He has long been involved with academic programs and administration in the Faculty of Agricultural and Environmental um, Sciences. Now, before moving downtown, uh, he was Associate Dean Student Affairs. Now, I have to tell you that we invited him to a meeting at MCLL, and I was posted at the top of the escalator to intercept him and bring him to the office where we were meeting. So I was standing there, and I'm mentally ticking off people, and I'm going, student, 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 prof, student, student, graduate, student, prof, prof, student. So you see where this is going. He got past me. <laughs> All right? <laughs> I never saw him. I never even came close. I think I had him pegged as the grad, graduate student. I'm not sure. Um, and, and I was very embarrassed because I had missed entirely that he is a senior administrative person in the university and a very distinguished prof. So, uh, and as I've put in the next little bit, he's a man of considerable energy, uh, youthful energy, and he moves very fast. He has much academic and organizational experience and a very open attitude. He will be an effective champion of the students, and we're definitely glad to have him on our side. Welcome, Dean Buttle. <laughs> Thank you, that was very kind. You didn't mention the reason you missed me is because I was late for the meeting and was running. <laughs> I always seem to be running 10 minutes behind, always. Um, that was very kind, thank you. It's, uh, it's an honor to work at McGill and it's an honor to, to be Dean of Students. And this isn't a career path that I, I saw for myself. In fact, as mentioned, I study bugs. So you might say that I have no experience or qualifications for being an administrator uh, at McGill. But that's the interesting thing. We talk about experience, right? Wisdom and experience. I don't think I have a lot of wisdom yet. I'll get it eventually. But you gain experience along the way. And what you learn as your professional career, what you thought it would be, obviously changes many, many directions. And I must say, working in student affairs is the most enriching and fascinating aspect of any university. Uh, it's at the interface of some of the most difficult topics we face as a society and the most difficult topics we face at the university. It's a wonderful sphere to work in and lots of good energy there. I want to start with a little story about my babcha. Uh, the reason I wanted to start with this, well, a couple reasons. One is, um, it, you know, how you get interested in this topic that we're talking about today. How does sort of a mid-career bald guy with a beard suddenly say, I'm going to stop studying spiders and work as an administrator and then get interested in lifelong learning and living. How? When I was a kid, my, my babcha, you know, she's Polish, she grew up in Poland and, and during the Second World War she was taken to a labor camp in Siberia. So as a kid, I learned uh, stories from her about um, her uh, path during the Second World War. And she talked about how in Siberia there was really no reason why you, you could easily walk away because it was so remote. So her and her, uh, her sister walked away from the labor camp and spent weeks traveling through Russia, hopping train to train, farmer's field to farmer's field, hiding in, in, in farmer's barns, uh, looking for food. Made it all the way back to, to west, made it to England. Then she 
uh, joined the war effort, drove a truck, met my grandfather, who was, who was uh, fighting with the Polish Free Forces, and they survived, and they had a story to tell. And they came to North America, and here I am. Wow. <laughs> the number of things that happened, right, along that pathway. And so as a kid, when I, when I learned about World War II, this is, this is the piece about wisdom and experience, right? It's not you learn different facts when you take a class. You've all taken many, many classes in your lives. But when you add a narrative that includes wisdom and experience, it changes the whole dynamic of how you think about the particular time in history, or whether it's physics, or whether it's discussions of, of uh, technology and artificial intelligence. So this is the element, and I go, we, talk, you know, we had trouble defining wisdom. Yeah, wisdom's a tough one, but you kind of know it when you see it, or know it when you hear it, or know it when you're experiencing it. So as a kid, when my, when my babcha, we'd make pierogi, pierogies, that was a thing that, that I did with her, was make pierogies, that was great. I can't make them anymore. Well, she made them and I watched and sampled. <laughs> Uh, she would tell these stories, and, and you kind of gain a, a different appreciation for what it means to, to be a lifelong learner, whether you're a kid or whether you're 65, and learning from people that have gone through different experiences and have that wisdom. When it, so I was really thinking about what got me interested in this topic, and it does go back, I think, to those times in your lives where you experience uh, or, or have interactions with people that offer wisdom and experience around a particular topic. It's very, very enriching. And that's a key reason why I'm interested in this and why I think that this is a, a way that we can frame a transformation of the university is recognizing the value of those experiences and wisdom in our, in our academic sphere. So now I'm going to change courses a bit today. These, these are not my words or my opinions necessarily, but this is what I hear all the time about students today. There are some students in the room. You might disagree with me. And again, I don't agree with all of these things. But I hear and I see that students are absolutely engaged, passionate, compassionate, tech savvy, connected, good at code switching. We often hear multitasking. Well, we can't multitask, but we can switch very rapidly between tasks. And, 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 and younger generations apparently uh, can do this quicker than older generations. Don't see boundaries. I see this all the time. The siloed structure of a university is very frustrating for today's student. Uh, boundaries aren't viewed in the same way that they have been in the past. I see a couple of people, students I know, nodding their head. <laughs> Negative. I've also heard words that students today are self-absorbed, lack self-awareness, lack resiliency. I hear that all the time. Again, I'm not sure this is true, but this is the, the sum of the narrative that's out there, right? Tech obsessed. I hear this about kids all the time, and I have three teenagers in my house, so I'm, I'm faced with this frequently. Put away your phone. How many times, you know, as a, as a dad of teenagers, put away your phone, but you're on yours, dad. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> Careful. Less concerned about privacy. I think the way that, that we certainly see this through social media, in, in many cases, what I would consider never to post something on social media, uh, students might consider. So there's a different view around privacy. Uh, some say that students lack interpersonal skills because they're tech obsessed. I don't actually believe that, but I've heard that. And instant gratification is often used as a way to describe young people today. Maybe not necessarily, uh, uh, it's a generalization of course, but that idea of, of, of a lot of feedback is being really, really important. These are some things that I've heard. But, and, and, and I'm glad Kristen mentioned mental health, and, and I think we need to recognize that today's world is a very, very challenging one. The end, and mental health concerns are real. Uh, anyone that works in student affairs recognizes that the demand on mental health services is extreme, and it's, a, it's absolutely universities struggle with students in distress. Society struggles with people in distress. This is not a, a university-only problem. This is a, a much larger problem, and we're, we're one part of a larger society. Yes, it's a real struggle. And I read a really interesting article in September about uh, loneliness. So across the country, college freshmen are settling into their new lives and grappling with something that doesn't compete with protests and political correctness for the media's attention, something that no one prepared them for, something that has nothing to do with being snowflakes and everything to do with being human. They're lonely. Loneliness. 30% of the students at McGill uh, are international. So they come to the institution 
uh, without the same uh, family or support network that a student from Quebec would have. So loneliness could be a very, very big factor. So we're talking about what are students today, but we have to recognize that, that what students are struggling with, and this is many of the same things we struggle with, that's part of the narrative, right? So this is the big question. How do we at McGill help create and maintain a healthy learning and living environment for our students? That's the big million dollar question. How do we actually do this? So we've, I've described some characteristics of some students, uh, set the stage in terms of saying that, that absolutely students struggle. How do we actually help create and maintain a healthy environment? Well, let's look to our strengths. Bright, talented students, professors, and staff. We just, the, I, I caught the tail end of the last presentation. Yeah, people are very talented and bright here. It's amazing, right? Strong academic programs, impressive depth uh, and breadth of research. Engaged in large alumni community. Reputation, globally known, a long history of excellence. And we can't d dismiss, of course, the location of McGill, right? One of the best cities in the world, Montreal. Instead of saying weaknesses, I suggested things we sometimes struggle with. Uh, the decentralized structure again. So there's academic silos, but also we think about students, the international students, uh, compared to students that go to CEGEP, there's also a divide there because some students experience the, the res environment and others don't, okay? So there's differences in terms of those kinds of structures. How we engage with the broader community in Montreal, Quebec, Canada. The reputation, I mean, I put down Darwinian approach to academics, but <laughs> there's a lot of academic programs which really are, are, are geared towards uh, such a degree of rigor that you could, you could say that it's undermining well-being, okay? And self-importance. Uh, again, some view McGill and the McGill University as a university that uh, views itself more important than it is. Maybe. I've heard that. Okay. So how do we change the paradigm? How do we actually bring all this together? Well, this is the, you all, you all here today, right? <laughs> yes. We embrace this concept of lifelong learning and living. And, you know, I've talked to, where's Jill? Jill's here and Andrea's here somewhere here and, and other people in this room I've talked to, and there's a bunch of questions and things that always come up. Things like, how do I continue to learn? How do I continue to learn in my hometown if it's not Montreal? How do I be of service to McGill? How do I contribute to my institution? And not necessarily in just financial ways, right? Contributions in other ways. How do I share my wisdom, experience, and empathy with today's students? How do I help a student who's struggling? So I hear this from members of our community that are not students at McGill. So, and this is again where we can embrace that concept of, of building an institution that has different look on its boundaries and a different way of embracing lifelong living and learning. I've got a million ideas. I need millions of dollars to implement them all. <laughs> Let me just throw a few out there. New admissions pathways. We have different admissions pathways for uh, some students. Indigenous students, for example, have a different structure where they can come in without the traditional uh, um, pathway than, than many other students. Uh, what about totally different admissions pathways more broadly in terms of people that live within our community that maybe uh, uh, you know, can't, can't track down their transcript in the way that McGill needs it, right? Rethinking academic programs, degrees, and course availabilities. These are operational, but they're really important. And MCLL is a great example of this, but it needs to go much bigger than that, okay? How do we rethink programs overall, degree types, availabilities? The School of Continuing Studies does a really good job of recognizing uh, a different approach to availability for courses, but it needs to be completely rethought from the bottom up. Montrealers as floor fellows and res. I can't remember who, uh, we, we talked about this, I think. Uh, what about bringing members of our community into our residence halls? And, and uh, you know, the, the, this, the, this, I'm not saying these are all good ideas, by the way. These are ideas, right? <laughs> I'm not sure they're all doable. I just wanted to get you a list in terms of some ideas that, that we've been thinking about. Elders in classrooms, every classroom, sharing knowledge about, about where we are. The library is a community space. Expanding mentoring programs um, in, in very new and different ways. And I like the idea, we're talking about artificial intelligence as, as, and, and using AI as a tool to help facilitate connections, okay? 
creation of compassionate communities. I know the School of Social Work does this, and compassionate communities could exist in multiple parts of the university. I love this one, community experts on research supervisory committees. Okay, why not? Absolutely. People in our community have expertise that would be a valuable, to, valuable to a master's or a PhD student as part of their academic program. Let's bring that in and embrace that. Uh, satellite McGill classrooms across Quebec. Why not? Why not? Take down the walls, right? That's the idea is we can actually, we, when, and the thing that Jill and I have talked about is how do we create little projects and ideas? This is a, this is a long, these are long-term ideas, right? When the, this morning's talk around, uh, from Dublin, right, talked about the number of years it takes to think about an age-friendly university. These are not things, none of these things can be done easily, but I think it's worth trying them and worth actually uh, giving it a go and seeing how far we can get to change the paradigm completely. Why do we need to do this? This will cement the importance of universities in today's society, it will help with the well-being of all, it will embody the principle of learning as a process, not as the outcome of learning. The outcome's wonderful in terms of uh, convocation. I was there, la uh, what day is it? Tuesday. At Place des Arts. it was wonderful. It's great to have that as an end point, but learning is about a process. So this idea of embracing a concept of lifelong learning and living is embracing the concept of a process. Finding solutions to the world's wicked problems needs all the heads around the table, okay? and placing increased value on wisdom and experience. That's what some of these ideas would also help generate, a discussion and a recognition and an actual, um, very tangible way valuing wisdom and experience, even if we can't define those terms perfectly. So how do we do all this again? How do we at McGill help create a, and maintain a healthy learning and living environment? I think we expand the concept of student for one thing, and I think we embrace a new model of service where McGill and its community is at service to each other. Okay, and by its community, uh, we mean uh, many people in this room, but much, much bigger than that, right? We think about service both ways, and service is a tool and an approach that enriches the environment for, for all parties involved. And I think through some, these are, again, I, I'm not qualified to give this talk. I study spiders in the Arctic, <laughs> but, <laughs> After lots of experience in, in, with student affairs, uh, you start to see, uh, and, and the thing about th that, that I think is amazing about and why I'm so lucky to be in my position is Dean of Students works horizontally across the university, right? So being able to work a, a, in student affairs in an area that's across the university gives a perspective university-wide that's so enriching and there's so many opportunities. So I'm very committed to continuing to help work on these initiatives and work with MCLL and all of you so that we can actually bring to fruition some of the ideas and actually figure out which of the ideas are really good ones and which, which need work and clarification. So thank you.